Two quick points I want to make at the outset. First, I think it took a lot of, I don't know if it's hubris or just uh, humility uh, on Ken's part to refer to these White House photographers as the ultimate insider because the man we're going to be listening to today has been a White House correspondent uh, for more than 30 years. He is the insider's insider's insider. Um, but I'm sure he has a good perspective about these photographers. Uh, second, I just wanted to mention very quickly that uh, this for me is, is, was a, a thrilling book to read uh, when I was a political science student at Berkeley uh, many, many years ago. Uh, I did an honors thesis on the Mayaguez crisis Gerald Ford faced back in the 1970s uh, involving Cambodia uh, seizing a merchant marine ship with, with the mer American merchant marines off the coast. And uh, President Ford was in office at that time, still suffering from the uh, indignity of people thinking that, that uh, he pardoned Richard Nixon to pay Nixon back for appointing him vice president and eventually president. And this was a crisis moment in Ford's life. And uh, uh, the crisis, even though it wasn't hugely successful uh, for him, nevertheless rehabilitated his reputation. And for me, in that time period, I met one of the people who's mentioned in this book, David Kennerly, who's a very prominent White House photographer. I also met, while I was writing that thesis, Donald Rumsfeld. As a young person, I met him. Brent Scowcroft, if you remember him, back from the Iran-Contra Gate times. Bud McFarlane and others. These were all Washington insiders. But the person who gave me, as a 20-year-old, writing this thesis, the greatest information was David Kennerly, the White House photographer. And I had this moment of epiphany back in Washington talking to him when I realized that he was the fly on the wall, like all White House photographers are. They are really, as Ken describes in this book, uh, uh, voyeurs, uh, uh, archivists, recorders, observers, um, historians in many ways. And really, if you want to cultivate an insider inside the White House, the photographer is the way to go, without question. So I'm delighted that Ken has written this book. He is one of the longest serving White House correspondents in history, and he's traveled to more than 70 countries as part of his job for US News and World Report. He joined them in 1984 as a congressional correspondent and has covered the presidency, presidential campaigns, and national politics for more than three decades. And today he's going to give us an insider's view, as I said, the insider's insider, of a group of people virtually unknown to the public, White House photographers visual historians, as we were just mentioning, that can make or break a presidential administration as well as defining an era. Please join me in welcoming our insider, Ken Walsh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Yep. Um, well, thank you all for coming. I want to thank the George and the Commonwealth Club for all their wonderful hospitality. I've, I've done this before, and I always, well, I'm always very happy to come back. And my daughter, Jean, is here, lives in Oakland, works in San Francisco. She's an insider in, in San Francisco, so I'm really, really glad she's here with some of her friends. Um, <clears throat> when you uh, cover uh, the White House, as I've done for 31 years now, <clears throat> you're always looking for new ways to see the president. So you're always looking for new um, insights and new ways to, um, to see the president and the presidency. And I've done books on Air Force One, which is one way to do it, and now um, this book on the photographers. <clears throat> the photographers um, are the ultimate insiders. Uh, are uh, people who see things that virtually no one else sees at the White House. Um, they see things the family sees, but they see moments of pri crisis, private and public. They see big decisions being made. They see uh, the presidents in, in their sort of everyday um, public persona and privately. And so that's what I was trying to capture, seeing the presidents and the presidency through the eyes, the lenses, and the observations of these photographers, and that's what I wanted to talk to you a little about today. Um, we go back a little bit, a little bit of history. Abraham Lincoln was the first president to understand the importance of photography and image making. When he ran for president in 1860, Lincoln was known as a frontiersman and a backwoodsman, which wasn't a bad image to have, but he also wanted to add to his image as a man of gravitas. So he was giving a speech in New York to a group called Cooper Union, where the intelligentsia met, and he knew it would be a very important speech for him, and he got his picture taken to distribute around the country in that campaign. Um, they had something called carts visite, which are postcard size photographs that were being popularized around the country so people could get an idea of what these famous figures in politics and show business and so on looked like. So he wanted to have one of them distributed. So this was before his beard entered the picture. He went to the studio in New York the same day as the speech of Matthew Brady, who later became the famous Civil War photographer, went to his studio and explained what he wanted done. 
And Brady was appalled because this was not a good looking man, first of all. He said, how am I gonna make this guy look so appealing to the country? And um, uh, usually what they did in those days, they took headshots. So what Brady did, in order to uh, sort of not highlight Nixon's complexion, which was not good, his long neck, he put his collar up higher so he didn't look so gangly. He pulled the camera back so you wouldn't see his dusty, wrinkled clothes in close-up. <clears throat> and you got to see literally the stature of Lincoln, who was much taller than men of his age. And his hand, as you can see, is resting on some books to indicate erudition. And this worked. This did change uh, Lincoln's image. And he said later that uh, he didn't think he would have been elected president without this photograph changing his image around the country. When he was elected president, he had photographs taken, um, <clears throat> about 130 pictures taken during his presidency. This is the image he liked to convey, the strong, resolute Lincoln, and uh, this helped his image while he was president as well. So first president to really understand image in politics and in governing. We can't talk about all the presidents now, we're gonna fast forward, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, believed in something he called the strenuous life, where you would achieve everything you could publicly and privately, and he used photography to illustrate that in his life. He uh, liked to have pictures taken of him doing lots of active things, including jumping horses. He'd hire photographers, there were no White House photographers at the time, and this, in this particular case, he wanted to distribute pictures of, uh, through the news media of him jumping the horses. He came back after this photo session, and he was all scratched up and, and had, had all kinds of uh, problems with his clothes. He had fallen off the horse several times. Now, you didn't see those pictures, but you saw the one that worked of him jumping the horse. And um, he also used photography to enhance his agenda. This is him with the famous naturalist John Muir at Yosemite. And so what he's doing here, he's, he's conveying his own popularity to his agenda to preserving the great open lands of America. And this succeeds also. His agenda does become quite popular and he uses photography to do this as well. Uh, this is a wonderful picture of the, the, uh, the personality <clears throat> of Teddy Roosevelt. <clears throat> His daughter said he wanted to always be larger than life and he always wanted to be the baby at every christening, the bride at every wedding, and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> I think you get that sense from this picture. Franklin Roosevelt, his distant cousin, comes into office. He also understands the importance of photography. This is the jaunty, um, optimistic uh, Franklin Roosevelt. He was very careful in how he uh, controlled his image. Again, there were no White House photographers on staff at the time. It was news photographers. He came to sort of a corrupt bargain with the news photographers of his time. Uh, they would not show his disability. His legs were paralyzed from polio. They wouldn't show him being carried around, which he was. They wouldn't show him using crutches or braces on his legs from his hips to his ankles that he locked at his knees. And he gave them a lot more access than other presidents had given. And they agreed to this. Lots of times later, they regretted it because they felt it was sort of breaking the code of journalism by cooperating and keeping this secret from the country. But they did it at the time, and that was one way he got so many positive pictures around. This is the picture he got, uh, the, the news photographers of uh, uh, Roosevelt. This is sort of the commanding presence of Franklin Roosevelt with Stalin and Churchill. Uh, but he let the photographers take him, his picture, as he progressed in office, and just look at how he has deteriorated by the end of his presence, he had terrible heart ailments and he was exhausted much of the time, but he let the photographers take the pictures because this is the condition he was in. And this is a rare picture of him at Hyde Park, New York, in his wheelchair. Uh, he didn't let this kind of picture get out. Uh, as I said, when the news photographers saw a new photographer on the beat taking a picture of Roosevelt in situations like this, showing his disability, they would actually slap the camera down so the new guy couldn't get the pictures. But some of the family got the pictures, so you can see these in the archives and at the Presidential Library in Hyde Park. <clears throat> and this is, again, the image that he liked to convey of the V for victory, the optimistic president who got the nation through the Depression and World War II. Uh, fast forward, uh, uh, we can't, as I say, talk about all the presidents now. Harry Truman, has, I have a chapter on him in the book, but he was not big on photography, but President Eisenhower wanted to be the president for the period of normalcy, 
had gone through a terrible depression and World War II. The country wanted some normalcy, so he used photography to illustrate that. This is uh, Ike and his uh, wife, wife Mamie. <clears throat> they, they actually released pictures of him in his home in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, their farm, where Mamie insisted that no business be conducted, no politics be discussed. It was family time, and she wanted him to take a break because he had problems with his heart as well. So they had pictures like this that they sometimes released. Ike doesn't look too wild about playing Scrabble here, does he? <laughs> he wasn't wild about some of the activities that his wife had. He's, I think his mind is elsewhere. But uh, it is recorded for posterity, sort of how um, Eisenhower dealt with this normalcy uh, and his home in Gettysburg, which they release occasionally in photographs, which, which are part of the visual record at his um, library in, in Kansas. <clears throat> President Kennedy, his father, uh, people tend to forget, in addition to being an investor and fabulously wealthy from that, he was a Hollywood producer. He understood how to make movies, he understood the concept of celebrity, and he was grooming his sons for public life. His oldest son, Joe Jr., was killed as a flyer in Europe in World War II. He was the one that the father was grooming to be president. <clears throat> then Jack, the next in line, was, took the grooming, and Jack's uh, reputation as a hero was promoted by his father through photographs like this of him uh, as a commander of the PT boat in the Pacific, as you might remember, the a Japanese vessel uh, rammed his uh, PT boat, sank it, <clears throat> and he rescued a couple of the crew members at great, it was great difficulty, but he was actually a genuine hero. So the father kept this image going as Jack got closer to running for Congress, for the House, and then the Senate, and then the presidency. Also, the uh, social part of things, this is the, ma the wedding of Jack Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy in Newport, Rhode Island. This was the hit of the social season in the Northeast. Uh, Look Magazine, Life Magazine, the picture magazines at the time had a lot of pictures. They gave access to the photographers. And so now you see the images now extending to the family, his immediate family, his lovely wife. When he's in the office of the president, he actually capitalized on his children. He was convinced that nobody could take a bad picture of the kids, and <laughs> he was actually right about that. This is the kind of pictures they would have. He'd bring in... <clears throat> trusted news photographers, his own White House photographer, and he has hired now a chief photographer named Cecil Stoughton, who was a military and army captain in the photo service. So Cecil is taking a lot of pictures of him, and this is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the kind of thing he's getting. He sits in his uh, chair, he claps his hands, and Caroline and John Jr. dance for him. This is probably the most famous picture of the family with little John in the desk, where he had a guy named Stanley Tredick, who was a photographer he trusted, a news photographer who he arranged to do a, a, a photo spread on the president and his son. But Jackie, at this point, thought that kids were getting too much attention, so she said, I don't want the pictures taken of, of John Jr. So Jackie went on vacation to Greece with her sister and some friends. President Kennedy called Stanley Tredick, the photographer, and said, the coast is clear. <laughs> Come on over, and he did. Little John, at that point, went into the Oval Office, and he said, I'm going to my secret house, which is the little trap door in the desk, the famous Resolute Desk, as they called it. President Kennedy sort of goes along with it. Little John liked to open the door and sort of scare people, he thought, and Dad liked the image. But this is a great picture, sort of showed the family and how Kennedy's blending his official work with family time. Probably one of the most famous pictures ever taken of a president. Uh, just uh, real quick here, a little most, a notion about Kennedy in office, the uh, press conferences, which became very famous for. Uh, you can see the charisma and the wit here that is conveyed. He did allow private photographer uh, moments in serious uh, times, like when he met Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union in uh, Vienna. The meeting did not go well. You can get that sense here that Kennedy is trying to make a point with Khrushchev. Khrushchev does not look like he's He's uh, very impressed, and he wasn't. He thought Kennedy was callow and immature, and he could get the better of him, which he tried to do in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but he misjudged Kennedy, and Kennedy actually got the better of the Soviets in that big crisis. But uh, this gives a little bit of a sense of their relationship. So what he's doing here is he's letting the photographers see the private moments the presidents had not allowed until then. This is another f famous picture of Kennedy. Uh, he had a photographer from the New York Times that he trusted named George Thames, who's now passed away. 
he gave George access to a day in the life of the presidency where he actually got into, in and out of the Oval Office all day. Uh, and uh, without special permission, just in and out constantly. Maybe there was a few moments when there was a secret discussion going on for national security, but George was basically there. He noticed Kennedy at one point standing at the window and bending down. He used this picture in the New York Times Sunday Magazine and he entitled it, The Loneliest Job. That's not at all what it is. It, does, it looks like the burdens of the world are on his shoulders. All he's doing is reading the newspaper standing up. <laughs> That's all it is, but it's taken on a life of its own, and he liked that image, so he didn't ever correct the record, but George Thames later explained that that's actually what he was taking a picture of. Kennedy had a bad back. He liked to read standing up. That's all the picture is. And then, um, of course, uh, <clears throat> the famous poignant moment of, uh, at the funeral where uh, little John Jr. was saluting his dad. We all remember this picture. Um, the, a lot of the photographers were in a one station one position, including Kennedy's own photographer, Cecil Stoughton, and they were t focusing on Jackie Kennedy, the widow, uh, Bobby and Teddy, the brothers, and Caroline, and only two photographers of about 100 got this picture, two news photographers. What happened is Jackie bent down and said to John Jr., why don't you step forward and salute and say goodbye to Daddy? And he, came, he did that, and this is the picture that so many people remember from the funeral day, sort of capturing that awful time in our history. Lyndon Johnson, this is probably the most famous presidential picture ever. President Johnson being sworn in on Air Force One the day Kennedy was killed in Dallas. Uh, Jackie Kennedy is standing there in the picture with the same outfit she wore that morning with her husband's blood on it. <clears throat> um, it's in a suffocatingly hot compartment. The plane had been out there all day. Johnson has brought in a local judge that he knew to swear him in. You can see that here. Uh, Johnson, realizing the importance of this picture being sworn in, he didn't have to do it legally, but he wanted the country to know the Constitution endured and that he would continue the Kennedy legacy. So he wanted this picture taken on Air Force One with Jackie. She understood. She went along with it. The Kennedy entourage did not. They resented Johnson for putting her through this. As I say, she understood it. This picture was taken by Cecil Stoughton, who was Kennedy's photographer, was of course still on duty then, and it's become one of the most famous presidential pictures, if not the most famous, of that terrible day and that swearing in. Johnson didn't get along with Cecil Stoughton, who was really Kennedy's guy. <clears throat> he would sit in the Oval Office, and a lot of people ask me, how are these pictures released? Well, Johnson would approve every picture himself or disapprove it. He would wait till the end of the day and Cecil would give him his pictures and he'd have a stack of them on his desk in the Oval Office and he'd look at them and he'd throw them on the floor as he didn't like them. Sometimes he was, he was left with nothing. And he said to Cecil, how come you don't make me look as good as Kennedy? Well, <laughs> that was not gonna happen. And so he tried to devise some, some uh, moments that he thought would endear himself to the country as sort of a regular person. This is one thing we got big trouble on. He, would, uh, he had two beagles. Uh, you might remember this. If you, anybody who uh, paid attention to Lyndon Johnson will probably remember this picture. He did it more than once, as you can see. He liked to pick his beagles up by the ears. <clears throat> and he, when he did it the first time, he got a lot of letters saying, you're abusing your pets. He did it the second time, he got even more letters, and so he didn't allow this picture to be taken again afterward. <clears throat> Another point, he thought that um, he was sick. He had gallbladder surgery, and he thought there were rumors around that he had cancer, and he wanted to contradict those rumors, so he had this picture taken of him by the news photographers showing off his gallbladder scar. I'm sorry to to show this to you as a, as a uh, moment of, uh, of, so, sort of a sort of a gross moment with Lyndon Johnson, but this is the way he was. And this, this he, but he felt it was effective because it showed that he did not have cancer. It was really a gallbladder operation, much less serious. Um, he's hired at this point a Japanese American photographer who took pictures of him when he was vice president. He always liked his work. His name is Yoichi Okamoto. He was from Yonkers, New York. His parents were actually, um, persecuted for being Japanese during the war, uh, but he overcame that. He became a combat soldier, very tough thing for a Japanese American to do in those days. Uh, but he became Johnson's photographer, and he still suffered a lot of discrimination in that job because he was Japanese American. The memory is still fresh from World War II. In this case, Johnson allows one of Okamoto's deputies to, to take a picture of him listening to a tape recorder, which you can see at the bottom right of the picture, of his son-in-law, Chuck Robb, who was a combat soldier in the Marines, 
later became governor and senator from Virginia, married, of course, to one of Johnson's daughters. And um, so Johnson had sent this guy into harm's way, and he's describing what combat is really like. And Johnson is very anguished by it. He's trying to put the best face on the war, which is not going well. But privately, he was really anguished that the war was not going well, and he couldn't really get out of it in what he felt was an honorable way. It was the main reason why he didn't run for re-election in 1968. But this gives that moment, that private Johnson, that he wanted to keep from the country, but it is in the archives now. <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson then does not run, Richard Nixon wins the presidency. He wanted always to be seen as the tough guy, no, never showing weakness. <clears throat> we get resonance with President Trump over that today, don't we? And I'll come back to him in a little bit, but this is the image that Lyndon Nixon likes to show. His family uh, said, well, you need to show more of the personal side, to show that you're a nice person, that you know how to relax, that you do things other people do. So he went to his home in San Clemente, California, and uh, his daughter said, why don't you take a walk on the beach and relax? And he was a workaholic. So this is the picture they ended up getting of him walking on the beach. <laughs> he's in his wingtips, his suit trousers. Uh, doesn't look like he's relaxing too much to me, but uh, this is the picture that they released. Um, Nixon also, at occasion, tried to reach out to different constituencies in the country. There was a call that came into the White House one day. The caller said, this is Elvis Presley. I'd like to meet the president. I'm a fan of law enforcement. I want to get a badge so I can help catch drug traffickers. Now, the irony is that Elvis was an abuser of prescription drugs himself at this time. But he manages to get in, and uh, Nixon initially didn't want to do it, but his staff said, well, maybe young people will think you're reaching out to them. This might be good for your image with young people. And so he said, well, I don't know what I'm going to say to this Mr. Presley. I don't know anything about him or his music. Uh, so Elvis comes over, and they get this picture. Um, this is the single most requested picture from the National Archives of any president, by the way. People still want to see this. Uh, Nixon says to Elvis, that's quite an outfit you have on there, Mr. Presley. And Elvis says, you have your audience and I have mine. <laughs> so it came as a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, comeback. It didn't do much of the, neither of them much good. Elvis gets his badge, doesn't really use it. Nixon gets his picture, didn't really help him. <clears throat> Nixon did, as I say, did not want to show vulnerability. But when he announced he was resigning from, August, from office in August of 1974, uh, he then had a dinner with his family because he was leaving, actually leaving the job the next day. He actually called his photographer, a guy named Ollie Atkins, who had he had excluded from many, many opportunities. And Ollie was stunned that Nixon would say, come over and take pictures of me. I know I'm leaving office tomorrow, but I'd like to get some pictures of the family. And this is one of the rare cases where he showed some vulnerability. Uh, his daughter is Tricia, who's there with her husband, Ed Cox, is, is ready to burst into tears. He's hugging his daughter, Julie. His presidency is ending dis in disgrace since leaving the next day. This is one of the rare cases where he gives the photographer an opportunity to take the vulnerable side of Richard Nixon. Maybe things might have been a little better for him if he had shown this earlier, but he didn't ever do that, and, uh, or did on very rare cases. <clears throat> and he does leave office the next day, but this is the rare, vulnerable Richard Nixon that uh, he wanted to keep from view, but he relented at the end. Now, um, Joe had mentioned David Kennedy and Gerald Ford. This is Gerald Ford who succeeds Nixon, had been his vice president. This is the sort of ruminative, pipe smoke, smoking Ford. Uh, Kennerly had fabulous access to Ford. And one thing that the photographers will tell you, and I've talked to many of them over the years, and in addition to looking at many of their thousands of their photo photographs, the photographers need two things. They need to be good photographers, and they need to have the trust of the president and the first family, particularly the first lady, or they don't get the access they need. And Kennerly had this. Uh, Kennedy gave that to some of his photographers too, but Kennerly really pioneered this idea of the to almost total access to President Ford, including when he took spills on the ski slopes. You remember Saturday Night Live mocking him for bumping his head, falling, tripping over things. So he had the image of sort of a nincompoop, and I remember uh, I was at the Denver Post, and I was covering him for the Denver Post before I got to the White House beat, and uh, he, I won his award one time, and he said, um, so you're the only reporter that was writing about me falling on the ski slopes. And I said, yeah, but I wasn't taking the pictures. And he said, well, don't worry about it. I'm the one who took the falls. I'm the one who's responsible. So he was very magnanimous. He really couldn't convey that to the country, but he did convey the everyman idea. This is a picture of very, no other president probably would have ever done something like this. 
He's at a high level meeting, that's Donald Rumsfeld, who's sta- sitting there on the, on the right, uh, Jerry Ford in his um, pajamas with his robe on, having a meeting uh, with files on the floor. Um, but he, um, he, did, uh, he was an everyman in many ways. Didn't mind this kind of picture being taken, but he really couldn't convey his best images to the country. Uh, his best qualities. Um, he loses to Jimmy Carter. I don't have Jimmy Carter in this talk, although he's in the book. One reason he's not in the talk is that he did not hire a chief photographer. He thought it was uh, beneath him, that he did, it was a waste of his time to have private pictures and recording of history. He had staff photographers, but not a chief photographer, so no one really bonded with him. So that's why you don't see hardly any pictures of these ingratiating pictures that other presidents take. You don't see them with Carter. You do see that with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan loved being taken pictures. He was a former um, Hollywood actor, television host. This is one of his favorite pictures of him, the Westerner, the, the Western land man, the cowboy hat, the genial, um, you know, friendly Ronald Reagan. He, this picture was taken by a guy named Michael Evans before he took office, but this was widely distributed throughout his presidency, and he hired Evans as his chief photographer. This is a very famous picture, Reagan, when he was shot and almost killed in the assassination attempt in 1981, several weeks after he took office. This is actually the moment where he's hit by the bullet. You see his Secret Service agents are looking off to, at the shooter, John Hinckley Jr. Reagan is not quite sure what's happened here. What's happened actually is that a bullet has bounced off the side of his armored plated vehicle, hit him in the side. The, the uh, agents push him in the car and uh, he thinks they've broken one of his ribs. And he starts to cuss at them, but they realize he's been hit. Uh, they take him to the emergency room and uh, he always tried to be acting the role of president. I'm not saying that critically. So he gets out of the car on his own steam, hitches up his trousers, buttons his jacket, walks into the emergency room, and then collapses and almost dies. So if those agents hadn't taken him to the emergency room, he would have died if they'd taken him to the White House. But this p- photograph won a Pulitzer Prize for a news photographer who was in, in the position to get this. The White House photographer was not in the position to get this, the staff photographer. So this was the Pulitzer Prize winning photograph. Uh, Another interesting moment, um, uh, real quick, uh, Reagan goes to the Reykjavik summit in his second term with Mikhail Gorbachev. They were talking about some very profound things, ending nuclear weapons, um, uh, what to do with this Star Wars system that was designed to shoot down missiles that Reagan believed in. The whole effort failed. And so they're leaving the summit in failure. You can see from the photograph the disappointment in both of their eyes. Uh, Gorbachev is walking Reagan to his limousine, and the the White House photographer, Pete Souza, who was a junior photographer on Reagan's staff, now later became President Obama's chief photographer. Uh, Pete Souza overhears them through the fans later saying the concluding words Gorbachev says, I don't know what else I could have done. And Reagan says, you could have said yes. And that was in all the stories the next day. So he actually observed this and heard this <clears throat> very important moment uh, as, as a part of the fly on the wall uh, concept. Uh, this is another interesting, a little lighter moment. Um, Reagan liked to have parties for his Hollywood friends and all. Uh, this is a case where Frank Sinatra is dancing with Nancy and Reagan is cutting in. He doesn't look too happy here that Sinatra's dancing with his wife. Um, and uh, they released this picture because they felt it showed sort of a natural reaction on the part of Ronald Reagan. Initially, Ronald and Nancy were not happy they released this, but then they felt it did accomplish the purpose of showing that he was more of a regular person than people might have known, so they put the picture out, but it's a little behind-the-scenes image of Reagan that people were somewhat surprised at. Another thing that Reagan did, he liked correspondence. He He was a pen pal with many people, And uh, he went to a school in Washington, D.C., and he met a very precocious young student named Rudy Hines. And he continued to have a pen pal relationship with him for the rest of his life when Rudy grew to to a man. And secretly, Reagan would actually go to Rudy Hines' apartment in Washington with Nancy and have meals there. And his philatelist photographer would take a picture of him. He's a a young African-American fellow with a single mom, they're they're eating dinner that the mother has prepared for them. They had them over to the White House, again, all in secret. And so Reagan had the image of being so isolated from everyday people, but he was trying privately 
in many ways to reach out, and this is one case where he did it with Rudy Hines. Um, and then he also had a sense of humor about himself. Uh, he would sometimes mug for the cameras and let that picture be out there. Uh, we can't imagine that happening today, for instance, but nevertheless, uh, that's what Reagan did. And this is one of his, more, his famous pictures that he really liked is him, uh, the ch charge picture at uh, his ranch. And, uh, but he did understand the importance of photography and he let pictures like this out to show this uh, Western outdoor, uh, non-Washington kind of person. President Bush uh, takes office. President Bush was a man who didn't really convey his best qualities to the country. He always um, was very insecure that he could be the kind of larger than life figure that Reagan had been or Teddy Roosevelt or other presidents. I remember interviewing Ray, uh, Bush a couple of weeks after he took office and he said, you know, I'll never be the communicator that Ronald Reagan was. I'll never have the ability to um, to have the image, he, positive image he has. I've been six foot three since I've been 18 years old and people always have thought I'm a little guy, he said. I thought that was very interesting. He thought he was actually diminished by the attention. But one quick moment with Bush that uh, you might remember, this is the picture taken of him at his home in Kenny Bunkport, Maine. His photographer, David Valdez, was able to ingratiate himself with the family, and a lot of people have asked me, how does that happen? Well, in the case, uh, the different photographers have different methods. Getting the family on your side is a key thing, and uh, this was a case where Bush is still vice president, but he keeps David Valdez as his photographer, as his president, and so uh, he was gonna do, uh, he agreed to do a um, photo spread for Life magazine, uh, the, uh, George Bush um, about to run for president in home at Kenny Bunkport, Maine at his estate. So Barbara and George Bush decide, they go for the photo spread, but they want Valdez to take the pictures. The magazine agrees. Barbara says, why don't you show up tomorrow at six o'clock in the morning and see what happens? He shows up, the door of the bedroom opens and all the grandchildren start flooding in. Barbara is camera savvy, George is not. Look at him, he's disheveled, his hair is all messed up. Uh, things like this would happen and Barbara would get all upset and say, well, why don't you comb your hair or something? And he'd say, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna go for the stagecraft. He probably should have done more of it. Of course, he loses the election to Bill Clinton. Uh, we'll have to go rather rapidly here, but this is election night when Bill Clinton is first elected with Hillary and Chelsea. Um, the private Bill Clinton, he allowed some of this to be shown certainly at his presidential library, he had a flash and fade temper. And this is what you see here. He let his photographer uh, capture this, uh, Bob McNeely. What's happened here is that the press has had, a new, has had a briefing with George Stephanopoulos, who's now on ABC News. Uh, he was the communications director. There's David Gergen standing in the, in the uh, somewhat uh, stunned by what he's seeing. Uh, Clinton saying, you get out there and you give them what for, as he said, what for? He said, I want you to straighten them out to stop asking all these embarrassing questions. And of course, George couldn't do anything about it. But then the temper would fade. But this is the, sort of the private Clinton that uh, the photographers were able to capture. And you could see these at the library uh, in Arkansas. During that whole year, when he was under investigation for the Monica Lewinsky affair, and of course, he was impeach impeached for having lying about his affair with a former intern. The Senate acquitted him, but the House impeached him. Uh, during that whole year, uh, getting photo photographs of him and Le Monica Lewinsky were at a great premium. The White House uh, were not released the, what they had. Uh, then people found pictures of her, so that people knew what she looked like. A photographer from Time Magazine named Dirk Hallstatt, who was a friend of mine for many years, said, you know, I've seen them together somewhere. I don't know where I've seen them. So he hired a, a researcher and they went through hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pictures and they found the picture of them together uh, in, the, in his files of Bill and Monica. She would wear this uh, beret to capture his attention, which as we know, she did. <laughs> but this is a case where some perseverance paid off in getting a picture of the president that everybody was looking for. And it was a news photographer who did it. Um, this is a famous, the most famous picture probably of George Bush. We're coming up to present times now. The bullhorn, three days after 9-11, the uh, terrible hijackings have, have occurred. He's standing on the burned out hulk of a fire truck. I'm, I'm actually in the little group of reporters that travels with the president. I'm just off camera, but I'm sort of off to the left here, uh, just at the foot of this. 
Um, he actually starts to talk to the crowd. He pulls a fireman up into the, onto the, the uh, visible position on the fire truck. Turned out to be a uh, retired fireman who's there volunteering. He starts to talk. The f first responders shout, we can't hear you. He takes his uh, bullhorn from somebody and he says, um, can you hear me now? Um, uh, I know you can hear me, and the people who knock down these buildings will hear from all of us very soon, which was the big test of his presidency, which he actually passed that day uh, in uh, dealing with this ultimate crisis of terrorism. But that's the story behind that photograph. Um, now we're at President Obama, a celebrity from the beginning. You see the people with their cell phones taking his picture. It's the democratization of photography. Everybody can take pictures now. Uh, you know, it used to be you'd have to send them in for, to be developed and all digital photography. This is what happens now. It happened with President Obama, his photographer, uh, chief photographer, Pete Souza. Uh, actually, the White House had been digitized by Eric Draper, who was Bush's photographer, but Pete Souza continues this. The main thing he does is he continues the digital photography, and he knows that it's easier to distribute the pictures more than any other president has ever done. So Obama was probably the most photographed person in the history of the world, actually. Uh, and um, it was uh, the White House website, Flickr, Instagram, um, many, many venues uh, for this, and uh, Sousa took advantage of all of them. Uh, it used to be, for instance, in Kennedy, the photographer would get 10,000 pictures maybe in a year. Susan would get a million pictures. You know, you push down on that shutter, you're getting, you know, 100 pictures in a couple of seconds. And all those pictures are stored at the libraries and the archives. You have all those of Obama. Uh, he got tremendous access. This is the Situation Room where they're watching the raid that killed bin Laden. This is one of the most famous pictures. You can see Obama watching the in real time the actual raid taking place. Hillary Clinton looks like she's seeing something there she's not happy with, but this is a, he, they give Sousa access to the Situation Room on this very, very dangerous mission. Uh, they throw him out after a little while, but he did get the picture. This is another inside picture of the White House, the lack of, of um, privacy that all presidents complain about. Uh, they've had a formal event. Obama has lent Hill, um, uh, Michelle his jacket. They're in a freight elevator in a hotel, <clears throat> and they're having what seems to, seems to be an intimate moment. But look at all the guards, the Secret Service guys. They don't know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to intrude on their privacy. They're looking at the floor, out into the distance, over at the side. Uh, but this is the kind of picture that uh, Obama allowed to be taken and distributed. This is a, actually another wonderful picture. This is probably my favorite picture. This is uh, <clears throat> when Obama is uh, greeting a staff member who's leaving the White House service. Uh, an African-American family comes in with the staff member. The little boy <clears throat> says to the president, your hair looks like mine. And... He says, I wonder if it feels like mine. So Obama says, why don't you see for yourself? So he bends down, the little boy touches the top of his head, and Obama says, what do you think? And he says, yeah, it feels just like mine. But it's part of that role model that Obama tried to be for young African Americans, particularly young African American boys. He really take that, took that very seriously, and this is a very endearing picture reflecting that with Obama. Um, let uh, many, many pictures be taken of himself gave tremendous access, and his photographer did get the trust of President Obama and was a good photographer, too. <clears throat> now we're up to President Trump. President Trump, this is the larger-than-life Donald Trump that he likes the pictures taken of himself. Uh, this is the uh, image he likes, the tough guy in the truck. Um, I always wonder, now he's only been in office for a little more than nine months now, why they're not showing any pictures of the private more endearing, positive Donald Trump. Sometimes they do. This is the picture of him with his grandchildren walking across the lawn, trick-or-treaters at the White House. But this is the image he likes, this tough, no-nonsense Donald Trump. And when I've given this talk, people say, well, how come the pictures you have of Trump are all the scowling, angry Donald Trump? Those are the pictures he wants out there. He doesn't let the other pictures out, if they're even taking them. So, you know, I think he's missing an opportunity here uh, if there is a private side of Donald Trump that he's not showing, we have to consider that as a possibility, too. But so, so far, the images of the positive um, family Donald Trump, the sort of the more uh, kinder, gentler Donald Trump, are few and far between. He wants the tough guy image to appeal to his base as the fighter and the wrecking ball, 
that's destroying the establishment in Washington. And so this is the image he's, he's happy with now. We'll wind up. This is Cecil Stoughton, Kennedy's photographer. One of the t- t- techniques he used is teaching John Jr. how to use his cameras. So John Jr. always wanted to see Captain Stoughton, as he called him, to learn how to use the cameras. And it was a very effective device for getting access to President Kennedy because the kids always wanted to see Cecil, as they called him. Yoichi Okamoto, who replaced Stoughton, Lyndon Johnson's photographer, fabulous, fabulous photographer. He brought in the idea of storytelling to White House photography. This is a better image of him. You can get an idea what he actually looked like. We find the camera. Fabulous photographer. All his succeeding photographers at the White House credit Okamoto as being one of the best, if not the best. David Kennerly, this is a picture of him with Ford. Tremendous access to Ford. And here's Pete Souza <coughs> in action with President Obama. And this is uh, Sheila Craighead, who is President Trump's photographer, chief photographer. We have had a woman chief photographer before. Bill Clinton's last chief photographer was Sharon Farmer. Uh, she had the job for about two years. Sheila is starting off with tremendous disadvantages because President Trump is very controlling. He doesn't let her do her job as she wants to. Uh, she, he, there's not the trust relationship. Maybe it'll happen, but it's not there yet. So if she's getting the great pictures of him, they're not putting them out, but I don't think they're getting them either. And then finally, the uh, news photographers. This is sort of what they deal with. I talk about this in the book, the news photographers. Uh, this is the kind of op- way they operate. They're all getting the same shot. Very tough to get anything distinctive. It's the chief photographer at the White House who gets that. But i just give you a, one image of the news photographers and then finally the cover of the book. But I just wanted to leave you with the idea that these photographers are the people who see the things that so many other people don't. They have tremendous out- insights into the presidency. So that's what I'm doing in the book is to try to see the presidents through their eyes, lenses, and observations. So with that, we'll take some questions and go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, it's time now for audience questions, and when we have a number of questions from the audience. Um, so I'd actually like to start with one uh, of my own that, f- that feeds in with one of the questions uh, uh, from one of our audience members. Who, her, her, his or her question was, what's your favorite photo or photographer that captures a president's personality or true nature? And what I'd like to, uh, to piggyback on top of that um, is... You mentioned early on, uh, speaking of, uh, so I'll, I'll assume that by true, mat- true nature, the question uh, was looking at who is this person when, when nobody's looking, right? right. Who are, uh, character who is, as Moody said, who, who you are in the dark, right? Um, you mentioned that FDR did not like to be photographed in a wheelchair. When you were talking about Obama, I was, I was a little surprised that you didn't mention that he doesn't like to be, uh, Obama never liked to be photographed smoking. Right for example. Everybody's got something about them that they don't want to know. Well, he claimed um, that he gave up smoking. So, but anyway, but, but, that's another story. But it was also <laughs> who he was yeah. in some ways. And, and so uh, of the pictures that you've looked at, um, uh, what was your favorite picture out of these, I guess is a question from the audience member, of someone being caught, maybe even in a way that they didn't want to be seen, but somehow it got out yeah. of the way. Well, I think, you know, I think that those pictures of Ford, you know, he was only in office less than one term, he wasn't, wasn't elected on his own, but he did, I think, allow people to see him as he really was. That picture of him in his pajamas, there's a famous picture that, uh, that you can easily find uh, of him falling down the steps of uh, Air Force One when he was in Salzburg, Austria, in a rainy day. Uh, and that's, but the point I'm making is that he allowed people to see the private Jerry Ford and was very magnanimous about it because he said, this is the way I am. People should see me the way I am. Now, we may have taken a lesson from that. He did not win his election. <laughs> so maybe he was being too candid with this sort of stuff. Uh, I think the pictures of Kennedy, I mean, he, it was a genuine affectionate relationship he had with his little kids. <clears throat> Less so with his, with his, uh, uh, his wife, because he was, a, as we know now, a womanizer, but um, with the kids, I think those were genuine pictures of him uh, really enjoying the company of his children. And there were many, many of those pictures. It just was impossible to, to, uh, uh, to, to you know, show you all of them, of course. But uh, if you're interested, a lot of this stuff is, is online now, and you can find these pictures in the archives as the visual historian um, occupation of the, of the photographers becomes clear. You can get this stuff very easily, much easier than you ever had before. Hmm. More access. Um, 
another one of our audience members asked this question that actually feeds on the point you're just making about family, but I think he or she is going to take you in a different direction, and they're asking for your opinion on this. Uh, should photographers, and I assume you mean White House photographers, capture more intimate uh, family moments? Uh, the public loves it, but should family be kept private? And I'll preface this by also adding um, that I recall that the Clintons did not want a lot of uh, pictures of Chelsea or access to Chelsea. They wanted her. And I think the Obamas initially wanted to keep the daughters right. uh, separated from people. You've been an insider for 30 years. What is your take yeah. on that? Well, um, uh, it's interesting that uh, in dealing with the children, um, the media w have been very restrained in uh, using photographs or even stories about presidential children. Because, mm. you know, a lot of us have children, and we understand the desire to have them brought up in as normal and as environment as possible. There were many, many stories that could have been done on the, and, and photographs released uh, and used about the Obama girls, about uh, the Bush twins, uh, about Chelsea in the White House, uh, that were not done. I mean, Chelsea went to public school and uh, there were many, many stories that were floating around, but in an effort to, you can see it protecting her or however, it was protecting her. A lot of those stories were not used. The twins, the Bush twins, and this is an interesting journalistic ethics question, um, how much should you do uh, stories or photographs of presidential children when they may be breaking the law? Now, the twins were drinking underage drinking when they were in, in, in school. Uh, they also had cases where they escaped their Secret Service minders. They, they'd be in a toll booth and they'd be in the car and the Secret Service guys would be behind them and then they'd jam the, the accelerator and they'd lose the Secret Service car. The Secret Service guys not realizing that this is what they were going to do. So now, is that a story? Uh, that story did come out because it became a, question, a safety question. Are they taking too many risks uh, as uh, teenagers, really, with their... I think uh, I want to hire some new Secret Service guys, if that's the case. Yeah, well, yeah, well, but I mean, the, actually, they did after that. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I think that um, the, uh, the, the idea of the private moments, uh, most of the times, presidents are very careful about that. But Obama allowed a lot of private moments with his children to be shown. Mm. Uh, you, you might see pictures of uh, one of the daughters, Sasha and Malia, hiding behind a couch in the Oval Office, surprising the father, you know, lying on the floor, him with little children from other family members and, and other staff members. So he did allow a lot of that to be shown. Uh, but as we saw with Jackie Kennedy, sometimes they, the, the first lady in particular says, enough. Now, in, as I said, in Kennedy's case, he, he overruled her when she was out of town. But uh, usually, I think the, the uh, media is very respectful these days of the uh, privacy of the uh, first family, particularly the children, uh, not so much the first lady. It's going to be a big test with Baron Trump. Uh, Baron Trump, has, there's been some speculation now about uh, his uh, physical situation and his is he dyslexic? Uh, there's all kinds of, I don't think there's evidence of any of this, but there's been speculation. So he's getting more attention than the other uh, children have gotten in years. And Except the, for Don Jr. Uh, yes, except, well, Don Jr., right. But this is a little boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, let's stay on the Trumps for a moment then, sure. if, if that's the case. Well, actually, I want before we do this, I, there was another point to this last question I wanted to, to sort of raise with you. Um, I think the way the drift of that question was also, however, is there something maybe, if I'm interpreting whoever it was that wrote the question, is there something exploitive about uh, uh, looking at the children of the president, the family members who are not, I mean, they're connected to the presidency, but they're not the person you voted for and they need to grow up having some kind of normalcy. And I'll, I'll tweak the question by adding that these are also still candidates when they're when the candidates who feel no compunction about using their family to sort of promote an image. So is it, right. as a journalist, how do you see this? Is, are children or family well, I, fair game? Well, I think if a family is being used to make a political point, then I think they're fair game. In other words, um, if, uh, the, uh, if uh, President Trump would use Barron to talk about some policy point he's making about uh, whatever issue that he was focusing on, then I think the child would be fair game, particularly if there was a hypocrisy involved here. Um, and that's where the, um, 
the Bush twins, uh, there was an argument that since they were drinking and breaking the law, and President Bush had made a big point of fighting alcoholism and saying he had given up alcohol, well, what happened there? So there was an argument that there was a public policy point that you could talk about. As, when you get closer to public policy points, I think it's more easily for me to understand and agree with doing stories about the children. Uh, the other thing is, um, I think Obama came up with an interesting, um, a, a interesting solution. He said, I don't, we don't want any, Michelle and Barack Obama didn't want any pictures of the children unless the parents were there. And that's actually an interesting point because in other words, they didn't want pictures taken of the kids at school, going to school, going to concerts, going to games, ballet, that sort of stuff. And you didn't see those pictures. The media respected that. And I think that, that was good that we did that. Mm -hmm. But, but it, was an, it was an engagement with the president and the media that you don't see with Trump now. They came to an understanding that was mutually agreeable. With Trump, it's, it's always a fight. And, and so I, I don't have any uh, confidence that this is going to end well for anybody. You <laughs> think most journalists see it that way and photojournalists as well? Photojournalists always want more. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we in the, print, in the, in the print reporting corps, we always want more too. You saw that in the, in the current trip to Asia. Not enough access, not enough photo access, and so on. But I think most reporters, reporters who have families, understand the need to, to give the children some, some space. And that happens a lot now. And if the child is an adult? Much less so. Okay. Uh, and if, and then, then pretty much all the rules are gone. If the, and, the, and if the adult is getting into policy, as Trump's adult children are doing. Hmm. Okay. Another question from one of our audience members, an interesting question. She said, or he said, how often do presidents find themselves at odds with White House photographers? You mentioned that example of Johnson tossing out the, but I think where, where this person was going with this question was, um, it, it, has there been a struggle uh, over one where the photographer really wanted to get something out and, yeah. uh, and has it led to right. any famous pictures in your mind? Well, uh, you make a distinction. There's always fights between a president and news photographers, first of all, uh, constantly right up to today. News photographers don't like to be excluded from things, <clears throat> especially when, uh, as happened with, with, with Obama, I must say, Pete Souza excluded the news photographers from a lot of events that they had not been excluded from before, and there's a lot of hard feelings still uh, about Souza from the news photographers who felt they were excluded from things they should have been allowed to... to uh, Why did he do that, in your judgment? He wanted his own pictures used. Huh. It's pretty simple. He wanted to be the alpha photographer, and he wanted his own pictures to be the only ones that could be used. And some news organizations said, no, if we can't, we can't take them ourselves, we're not using a handout, which was considered visual propaganda. Tremendous fights over this at the time, and were never resolved uh, for the news photographers. They mm. were still upset by this. Now, the, the staff photographers, is a different story. Usually they get this stuff worked out. If they, if they have the trust, they understand what the president wants or doesn't want, and they pretty much go along with that. So you rarely have them saying, I've got to have this or I've got to have that. Sometimes I have it released. Sometimes it happens. Most of the times they're overruled though. And then the other interesting thing you might be interested in is how are the photo photographs released? Some presidents want to approve them themselves, uh, like Lyndon Johnson. Now in the age of so many millions of pictures being taken, they can't see them all. So they have to rely on the recommendations of the photographer and sometimes they just delegate it, as Obama did, to Pete Souza and the press office and the communications director. Hmm. So it's sort of a group decision. But in the end, if the president uh, gives the trust to the photographer, the photographer has a great deal of leeway in releasing the pictures, but understands when not to release something. So there's sort of a self-censorship that goes on there. Now, you can still see these at the archives and the presidential libraries because all the pictures that the photographers and the staff photographers that take are ours as taxpayers. They, we were entitled to those pictures. So you, you look them up and you can get them sent to you and you can, you can find them. But, um, uh, but uh, lots of them are not released, but the photographers on staff generally understand when they're going to get into trouble releasing something, so they don't. Well, let's, let's tease that out if this doesn't yeah. get uh, too pedantic, I guess. Um, you, in the presentation, primarily focused on White House photographers, but occasionally would veer into right. uh, journalists. 
you have called the White House photographers the insider's insider. From your perspective, or maybe this is an obvious question, are the responsibilities, um, the ethics for a news photographer different than for a White House photographer, especially one who has ingratiated himself and or his, herself to the family yeah. in order to get access? That is a, that's a good question. Um, the ethical standards are much different. Uh, the staff photographers are employed by the president. They're his public relations photographers. A lot of the news, the staff photographers don't like that. They, they won't like to hear me saying that, but they are. They're there, if they release a lot of bad pictures of a president, they're not gonna have the job anymore. That's the way it works. They're hired hands. Um, now, the news photographers, it's much different. They're not supposed to be there making the presidents look good. They're supposed to be reflecting the reality of what they see and what they think is going on. So much, much different standards. Um, you might be aware that right now there's a controversy with the news photographers and President Trump. The news photographers were excluded from many things during this recent trip to Asia. The reporters were excluded uh, from asking questions at a big press conference that Trump had in China. And then it turned out the news photographers were being excluded from getting ba very basic pictures of, of what were actually public events. They just weren't allowed to take the pictures. So the New York Times photographer, Doug Mills, who I know very well and who I quote in the book, then released a, pic a blank, a black picture, nothing. And he mm. said, this is what we're getting from President Trump on this trip. And it just showed a picture of a black frame uh, showing that they're getting nothing. And that's what he said, nothing. So, uh, and then they tried to make up for that a little bit, but it's, a tr it's, it's so they're picking up in some ways where Sousa and Obama left off by excluding the news photographers. And in my experience, that happens a lot. The, the, um, whatever one White House does that works as far as control mechanisms, the next White House picks up and keeps. And that's what Obama's doing with the strict regulation of the news photographers. In light of that, going a slightly different direction, we'll stay with Trump. But this has been a problem for, was it a problem for Obama? Was it a problem for Bush? It's been a problem in, uh, really in the last 20 years for everybody, leaks. Right. You've said, I think accurately in the book, which is a very good book, by the way, um, that these White House photographers are, as I described them in my opening comments, sort of the fly on the wall. Um, first, do you suspect that uh, any White House photographer might have been in the last 20 years also a leak source? And uh, as a reporter, can you confirm that? <laughs> <laughs> and could you name the president? <laughs> no, in fact, I, this is an interesting point because it became clear over time that the White House photographers and the news photographers would have internal mechanisms for dealing with this by saying, I'm trying to be as unobtrusive as possible. I, and that's, that's what they do to get good pictures. They, they, as, as we had talked earlier, uh, photographers, will, as Kennerly, I think, told you, uh, if he, they want to be the furniture. They don't want the president to even know they're there. And they, they don't after a while. They don't realize the photographer is there. That's probably what happened with Kennedy and that picture, the loneliest job picture. He didn't realize George Taines was taking the pictures. But that's what they want. They all want that. Uh, and there's been cases where a photographer has said, the president's trying to be a, a, a sort of courteous and it introduces the photographer. The photographer takes the president aside later and says, don't introduce me. I don't want anybody to even realize I'm there. I get better pictures that way. Now, um, but what I'm getting at is both the news photographers and the staff photographers will be at events and they're taking pictures and then they claim they don't remember what was said. I heard that from them many, many times, the news photographers and the staff photographers. And you know they mean exactly the opposite. Well, they have to hear it but they don't want to be brought into the idea of talk, speaking out of school. Mm. And, and, and I, I, as a reporter, many times I've asked news photographers at events, what did the president say to Gorbachev, blah, blah, blah. And they said, I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm just taking pictures. I'm not listening to the discussion. That's literally what they say. They just don't want to be in the position of being That's the pressed. news photographer. And the staff photographers. Yeah. They both say, uh, you know, I can figure out the, the, the context later I'm just taking as many pictures, interesting pictures as I can, and uh, I'm not listening, I'm not taking notes, I'm not doing anything. Some, now, I told you the story about Sousa and Reagan and Gorbachev. Some, they do hear a lot, sometimes they pass it on. Now he ran that through the, the White House communications office. Can we release this? That was approved. That was approved. Uh -huh. right. 
But, but anyway, so I think that they, they try to limit the, the circumstances where they, they can be in a position to release information or reveal information, uh, and they don't want to do that. They just want their pictures to speak for them. Okay, question from our audience. Um, is White House photography, and I guess stills, a better way to win people's, I guess he, this person meant voters, residents' hearts and minds? than other forms of uh, media. Yeah, I think it still is. And, and by the way, I wanted to add one other thing. What I was just saying about the White House photographers and the staff photographers not really talking about things, that's only during the president's time in office. Yeah. Now they'll talk about it. And I've talked to many of them about their experiences and, and they're in the book. I'm just talking about when they're in office. As visual historians and as observers, they're willing to talk about this stuff later after their presidents leave office. But that's part of what's in the book. Now, um, the, uh, the idea about photography, I, I, I think you're making the distinction about still photography and yeah. video. There, there are now videographers at the White House. Uh, they don't get a lot. You don't see a lot of this. It's still the still photographers that are, have the, the most access and have the most trust. Um, the, uh, and, and I was just talking to Mike McCurry, who, who is, I covered when he was uh, Clinton's press secretary, and he was talking about uh, how it's the still images, it's the, it's the photos, classic photographs that we tend to remember from the presidents. So, so many times, there's still something that still photography has to capture a moment that video does not have. I do think that's true. Okay, silly question for you as a follow-up to that. Black and white or color? Uh, a lot of photographers prefer black and white. They prefer, they think it's more dramatic. Spoken like a print journalist. And, right? and okay. more vivid. <laughs> they, they do uh, prefer it, um, but now uh, it's almost all color. But uh, like Bob McNeely, who was Clinton's chief photographer for four years, liked black and white, even as recently as the Clinton administration. And, and you saw that picture of him shouting at George Stephanopoulos. That was a black and white picture. So sometimes the photographers sort of think of themselves sort of as artists think that the black and white are more vivid and more uh, memorable than color. So I'll let you decide whether that's true. One last question for you. We're almost to the end. I'll ask this one to sort of uh, mm -hmm. sum up some things. We mentioned Gerald Ford before. Right. And uh, I think, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, he, people suspected, all of us who were alive at that time, there was that belief, whether it was fair or not, that this pardoning Nixon was quid pro quo for appointing Ford vice president. And he lived with that. And he also lived with Saturday Night Live and Chevy Chase, who wasn't that funny, goofing on him every Saturday night by doing pratfalls on the stage, if you remember. So that that supplemented by the news accounts of Ford playing golf and hitting somebody in the crowd with a golf ball with an errant shot, or as you mentioned, falling down the stairs of uh, the steps from the helicopter, whatever, um, sort of reaffirmed this impression of him as, uh, uh, as someone who had played football without a helmet, as they used to joke about him, which was, I think, unfair uh, to Ford. But all of the nicest photographs of Ford humanizing him could not overturn, if you like, or, yes. or alter that other perspective of him, which was coming from news, but also from entertainment media right. sources. Fast forward now to the present with Donald Trump, another person who has, as you write very accurately in the book, really been very purposeful. We didn't talk about that so much today, about how Trump is very demanding about how he is, uh, his, his image right. comes out, more, more so than most presidents. Also someone who has been ridiculed on Saturday Night Live and a host of others and, and had all other sorts of media, but also someone who uses a different medium in Twitter mm. to... Uh, counter these positions, but also possibly sometimes his Twitter rantings, I think, perhaps counter the images of these photographs that would otherwise be sympathetic to him. Is Trump headed the same direction as Ford, is where I'm going? Well, uh, I, uh, or, or Carter. With the same outcome. I mean, I mean, uh, the, the, Carter, the lack of pictures, sort of, the, uh, sort of humanizing the, the kinder, gentler Jimmy Carter, and uh, Ford had a lot of pictures, the kinder, gentler Ford, but there were so many problems the country was going through then. There was, there was the cynicism of Vietnam and about Nixon and the pardon that the positive images, and Kennerly will, t will tell you this, he could never overcome the enormous public relations problems that Ford had. A lot of it unfair, because he was actually an athletic guy. He was a very decent guy. He never could convey that to the country, no matter how great the pictures were. 
And uh, so, so there's a limit to what pictures can do for you. It has to be the right circumstances. I think that with Trump, we just sort of have an absence of those private pictures. I tend to think... So you're saying Trump is more like Carter? Yes. In that sense that I he, do. he hasn't had... I don't know if the private pictures exist with him. Uh, maybe they don't. Maybe he just isn't giving the access to people. But he apparently has a good relationship with his grandchildren and with his adult children. Uh, and um, so... I mean, I think he's missing a tremendous opportunity here. Maybe he will get there at some point, but he's nowhere there n near now. Now, the other quick question I, point I wanted to make is in, since I've been on this trip, I've been told that a new f official photograph has been released of Donald Trump, and I've seen it. The first one was the scowling, angry Trump with the, with the sort of the shadows in his eyes and all. That was released in January. The new one is a smiling Donald Trump. So maybe he's getting a sense now that he, he can't just keep appealing to his base as the fighter and the wrecking ball and the angry guy who's going to overturn everything that Obama did and so on. Maybe he's getting a sense that he needs to have a little bit more of a, of a, of a softer image for outreach. Now, this is just the sketchiest evidence so far because we, we don't see a lot of that kinder, gentler Donald Trump, and maybe we won't, but as I say, um, if he's as savvy as he thinks he is as a media person, he will get to the point where he realizes this is a tremendous opportunity he's missing to use photography to improve his image, but we haven't seen it yet. Maybe we will. Okay. Our thanks uh, to Ken Wall, Chief White House Correspondent for U.S. News and World Report, author of the book, Ultimate Insiders. White House photographers and how they shape history. We also thank everyone here as well as our audience on radio, television, and the internet. And a reminder to our audience here that Mr. Walsh's book is for sale and he'll sign books outside the room or actually at the back of the room following this program. And now I'm Joe Tuman, and this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.